buckled, Ellie, you buckled? Yeah. Let me see. Sometimes I'm the guy with the boys kicking it back. Or the guy. I might be the guy with Oh, hey honey. Oh, hi babe. How was your day at work? That was good. Hi buddy. Get your audience one side, okay? <laughs> Let's go inside. <laughs> well, that's a real couple in our church, and that ain't real far from real life. <laughs> um, we live in a time where it's feeling like more and more, I don't know if you've picked it up, but I, I felt it more than I ever have in my lifetime that there's a sense that if we disagree on something, if we see the world differently, uh, we can't get along. We can't really talk anymore. And, and maybe even we have to hate each other. You know what I mean? It seems like, boy, if we're on the other side of the aisle, whatever aisle it happens to be in the world, it's like, well, it's us and them. And, and even having conversations is getting tougher and tougher in our culture. But I absolutely believe that Jesus Christ, who, who we gathered to sing about, and pray about and worship today. The one who Jesus, Jesus, as at his name the darkness trembles. That Jesus is the prince of peace. In every aspect of life, including in how we relate to other people. So our question today is, can we disagree? Can we be different? And still find a way to love each other? Can we actually converse and talk and, and think in new ways? And... and what we're going to do is we're going to look at two accounts of Jesus. One, how, we're going to watch how Jesus behaved and treated people in differences, and we're going to learn from there, and then also what he taught about how do we respond when there's somebody who maybe not, doesn't like us or considers us their enemy or feels hostility. How do we respond? And so we're going to look at both Jesus' lifestyle and his teaching, because last time I checked, I'm pretty sure this is accurate, uh, if you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, brace yourselves, your life should be shaped by the things Jesus taught and did. Pretty wild, huh? You ready? Can, I, can I say that again? <laughs> if, if you say you're a Christian, then the things Jesus taught and the way he lived should shape how we think and how we behave. Can I get an amen? amen. And if you're not yet a Christian, we always have people at showing that are here in the worship center and the family worship venue online that are sort of checking out the whole Christian thing. Understand, if you come to the cross and confess your sins and receive Jesus, he's going to take your hand and he's going to say, walk with me, and for the rest of your life, you get to learn to be more like Jesus. And that's challenging. That will stretch, especially in a world and a time when there are so many differences and so many disagreements. So I want to begin by just sort of identifying that there's lots of disagreements, lots of differences in the world, and they're not all the same. There's, there, there's different kinds of levels. And so I've come up with three levels of, of disagreements or differences. Level one, are just the, kind of the small thing. So let me, give you, let me give you a level one disagreement here, okay? Uh, level one would be this, okay? <laughs> when you put a roll of toilet paper on the roll, it can either be facing the wall this way, or... You can turn it this way and have it go like this. So maybe this is a level three disagreement, not a level one, um, by the sound of all of you. But, but hopefully we can navigate and still love each other if we have a different view of how we put the toilet paper on the roll. Another level one would be you know, sort of culinary. So, so maybe you're know, dining. So you're traveling uh, with some folks in a car and you pull into a little town and it's getting late. You know, things are closing up and so you open your Yelp app and you check what's open, what restaurants are open. There's only two restaurants open. A small little hole-in-the-wall Mexican restaurant and a little family Italian restaurant. And you have to choose one of the two. Okay? Small Mexican restaurant. Who heads right to the Mexican restaurant? Okay, good, yeah. 
Italian family dining. Okay. And how many of you, how many, some of you are like, I don't eat after seven o'clock. Anyways, um, but, but the point is we can navigate these things. We, we can make our way through these things. Or, or maybe this, maybe, maybe it's in the sport, in how we view sports teams, maybe different perspectives. Like here's two radically different perspectives. One says the Warriors are the best basketball team of the decade, and the other say it's the best team of the century. And you have to decide, okay? Those are the only options. So, but, but, but I set some of you off. Some of you are going, you've gone level three on me because I cheer. Anyways, uh, so, so there's those things that, that hopefully they're surface, they're small, they're minor. We, we don't, they're not going to create too much tension. But then you can move to level two disagreements or differences. They're not all the same. So how about this? Education of children is done best in the public school, Christian school, home school. Don't vote, don't say anything, okay? Uh, but my, when my wife and I got married and our kids got to the point where they're going to start in school, we had to have that conversation. You know, husbands and wives have to work through that. Families have to de- determine what's the right thing. And that can create some tension. That you might even say, boy, we, we disagree, but we've got to figure something out here. There's things like that that, that maybe they raise the bar a little bit. Um, here's another a theological disagreement. We can know when Jesus will return or only God knows when the end will come. So this is called eschatology, end times. And there's entire churches and groups that are like, oh, we know when he's coming. Uh, we've got charts, we've got graphs, and, we, we do, and it's just, it's all laid out. Or it's like, well, no, God's on the throne. We're going to let him handle that. And you go, well, can we as Christians, well, now we can't, we can't worship with each other if we have a different view of the end times. No. We might say we, might say we disagree on how that's going to go or how much we can know or how it works, but hopefully we can still worship together and say we're followers of Jesus, even though we have different views of that. How we discipline children. Man, this is a big challenge in our culture. And, and, and couples should talk before they ever get married about how are we going to handle Because you have to do something with kids to help them stay in line. So how are we going to do that? Oh, these, these feel a little more emotional. And some people even kind of like, you know, oh, that's, that's you know, that, that depends, we've had some tension over that. But can we love each other? Can we navigate through level two disagreements? But then we're going one more level here. Level three disagreements or different perspectives. So this, this goes into something, something big and significant. So, so how about just spirituality and faith? You know, I'm a Christian, and this person I know is an atheist. Man, now you're talking different worldviews. You're talking different theologies. You're, 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 you're talking you know, a diff, just a different view of lots of different things. And you say, can I, can I be friends with someone that I have a fundamental faith difference with? And I would hope you would say, yes, I can. But it doesn't mean it's always Easy. That, that, that's one. Here's another one. Political convictions. Oh, there's no tension there. No, it's not a problem. There's even people right now saying, you said politics, you can't say politics in church. That's against the law. Um, but, but the reality is more and more things become polarized, and there's a sense that not only do we have different points of view of economics or of what, you know, different things, but we, we actually, uh, I guess we have to hate each other. I guess we can't even you know, even have a conversation anymore. And it's feeling like when you watch people try to interact, it's just yelling and screaming and not really meaningful conversation. That you can say, can we actually love each other and get along if there's differences there? Cultural differences. And that can be cross-cultural, which can be dramatic. But even, even like my wife and I, when Sherry and I got married, we came from two different cultures, even though we were both born and raised in the United States. She was born in West Michigan in a small town, Holland, Michigan, in a Christian home where they went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and they loved it. And they went, you know, and, and, and there's a certain just, I mean, a whole worldview. And I grew up in a non-believing home in Huntington Beach, California, in a very different culture. And you bring our lives together, and Sharon and I will jokingly say, except for Jesus, we disagree about everything. Um, because we're so different. And even now, we're pressing towards 35 years of marriage. Yeah, but... There's still some areas of life that she's just wrong about. No, uh, there, there, there's still areas where we, don't, where we don't see eye to eye. And we're constantly navigating that. So, so here's the issue. We live in a world that, that is sort of sending this message that if we, if we don't agree with each other on everything, we have to almost have this animosity and this hostility. And yet we who come to the cross and met Jesus, we met the one who looked at us when we were his enemies. And when we hated him and wanted nothing to do with him. And he loved us and he bore the cross for us and he died for us. And he says, you're supposed to be like me. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray today as we, as we dig into two biblical texts, as we think about just two simple ideas that could transform our lives and our community and our neighborhoods and our culture, and I believe the world, would you speak to us? Would you remind us that you are the prince of peace 
and will you teach us what it means to love and to care and to communicate with people and walk alongside of them even when we disagree strongly. And it'll remind us that, that getting along with somebody and loving them doesn't mean we agree. It just means that we love them even when we disagree. So speak to us and teach us now, we pray. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. Well, I'm gonna share just two simple lessons. If you're a note taker, you can write these things down. If you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of John chapter four. If you follow your Bible on your phone or your iPad, just put in John chapter four, open up the whole chapter, and we're gonna look at a, a section of text in the middle of John chapter four. And, and what's going on here in this text is that Jesus and his disciples have come to this area, this region called Samaria. And you have to understand that the Jewish people, and Jesus was from a Jewish background, the Jewish people, when they would travel towards Samaria, they would take whatever it took to travel around it and not even walk through Samaria. Because of, it's a whole history of a civil, civil war, uh, conflict, different beliefs. And so the Jewish people didn't even want the dust or the dirt of Samaria on their feet or on their sandals because it was dirty dirt. And they just didn't like these people. They'd avoid it. But Jesus and his disciples travel right through Samaria. And the disciples have gone into the, into the town to get some food. And Jesus is sitting in the heat in the middle of the day at the well. And, and here's what we discover in this, in this story. This is lesson one. I can listen to you and learn from you even when we disagree. That's the big lesson. I can listen to you and even learn from you even when we disagree. Follow along with me in the Gospel of John chapter four, beginning in verse seven. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, you are a Jew. And I am a Samaritan, and I am a woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And, and then the writer of the gospel says, kind of explains, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That's putting it lightly. There was no, I mean, there, there was a tension, a historical centuries-long tension, and there was no relationship there, all right? So we pick it up in verse 10, and this is radical. This is absolutely, if you, can, if you can get this, it'll change your life. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink. Jesus, if you know who, Jesus said, if you know who I am as the Messiah, if you knew me, who it is who asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus says, if you knew who I am as the Messiah, if you really knew who I am, not only would you not be surprised that I would ask you to do me a little favor and draw me some water, you, a woman, would have come to me, a man, in that culture, there wouldn't have been that kind of communication. You, a Samaritan, would have come to me, a Jew, people who didn't talk to each other. You, a person who was incredibly sinful, she'd gone through all kinds of struggles in her life, and him, a religious leader. He said, if you really knew who I am, you would have come to me and asked me to do you a favor. You'd ask me to give you living water. Jesus says, you, you, when you know who I am, you'd come and break all the rules to ask me to help you because I have what you really need. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this, this living, this percolating, flowing, you know, fresh water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank for it, from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. He's talking about himself as the living water. Whoever, get, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up, overflowing, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't have to get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. And the account goes on. It's a long account. Read John chapter 4. Get this whole account and this whole story. But they go on to have a conversation about worship, about the right place to worship, how to worship. They have a conversation about their history of the Samaritans, the Jews. They have a conversation that includes kind of life, brokenness, struggles, pain, loss. They have a conversation about morality and what's right and wrong. And, and I'm convinced that what we have in the Gospel of John, as a matter of fact, the Gospel of John itself says if everything that Jesus said and did was written down, Man, the whole world couldn't take all the books. There's so much that happened. So I think we're getting a little snippet of the conversation. But Jesus has this amazing interaction with this woman who, for all 
cultural reasons he shouldn't have even been talking to. So, so, so what do we learn from this story? What are some observations? Let me give you four observations. First, they knew and acknowledged their differences. See, we think sometimes if we're going to get along with people, we have to ignore that if there's differences, we just ignore them. No, no, they knew them. They faced them. They acknowledged them. You know, she, you know, you, you're a man. I'm a woman. That's a problem. You're, you're Jewish. I'm Samaritan. That's a problem. They acknowledge those things. We can acknowledge our differences. That's okay. Second thing, their disagreements were significant. These weren't small issues. These are century-long, systemic, cultural, uh, familial, his, you know, historical conflicts that involved civil war, that involved... I mean, th th there was lots of things. So they're going, these are serious differences. But... They had a hearty conversation, and they hurt each other. They actually had this extensive, meaningful, rich, con they talked, you ready for this? Like two human beings. They talked to each other. They shared their thoughts. They gave different perspectives. Read the passage, it's, it's beautiful. There's just this, and, and again, I think it's the cliff notes, I think there's a lot more that went on there, but there's this deep, rich, meaningful conversation that's modeled for us by Jesus. And then a fourth observation. Truth came to the surface while many of the differences remained. In this conversation, this woman came to understand that this man standing in front of her who said, I would serve you and give you living water. She came to understand that this man was the Messiah. That would have never happened had he just said, oh, you're a woman, you're a Samaritan, I won't talk with you. A door opened for truth. And by the time the conversation was done, guess what? She was still a woman. He was still a man. She was still Samaritan. He was still Jewish. There were still differences. But they had had this amazing interaction and conversation and truth, like that living water would percolate up through Jesus. Truth, because Jesus is the truth. It came to the surface. And lives were changed. Not just her life, but the life of people in her town. Read the passage. She goes in after all this. She tells the people in the town, come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. They had a long conversation. And she's saying, but he still loves me. He knows all about me. He knows all my dark places. Is this, is this the Messiah? Is this the one we've been waiting for? And that, that's powerful. So how, do, how, do we, how, how does this impact our lives? And we can observe those things, how Jesus interacted. But again, if Jesus' teaching and life should influence us, here's living the lesson and finding peace among disagreements. If we want to walk in peace in our relational world and live like Jesus, here's some thoughts. Number one. I will try not to judge you by outward appearances. I will, as Christians, we can say, I will not look at somebody, see one thing about them and say, I know everything about her. I got him all figured out. We see a bumper sticker on a car. Oh, I know what they believe, what they think, what they're, I mean, we, you know, we got it all figured out. And we may sit at a stoplight, look at that bumper sticker, oh, I know who you are, I know what you're about, you don't like me, and I don't like you. And it's like, maybe they borrowed the car from a friend. But we got them all figured out, right? Because of a bumper sticker. We're too quick to look at someone and put them in this little box. Different than me. Someone I disagree with. A bad person. Man, Jesus didn't look at us that way. He knew everything about us. And he said, come near to me. And, and, and so first, we gotta, I think we need to say, God, help me not to judge you by outward appearances. Help me not to come too quickly to my conclusions about people because we can do that so easily. Next. I will ask good questions and hear what you think and believe. Jesus asked her questions. He talked with her. He listened to her. He heard her. And we've got to learn to ask good questions of people and just listen, even when the answers are something we totally disagree with, even if the answer is totally offensive to us. Listen graciously. I, I, I had an experience years ago. I've shared this before, but I had an experience years ago one of the most profound experiences of my life of interacting with somebody radically different than me. I was on a plane flying at the wrong time to the wrong country because of an uh, ice storm in Chicago, and I, was just, and I got stuck in the wrong seat, and I was sitting next to the, a person, and this young woman sitting there, and as she tells me her story, I started asking her questions. She was an atheistic, humanistic, communist <laughs> who ran a camp to keep high school-age kids from becoming Christians. That's about as different from me as you can get. Um, and, and, so, so there we, and so I asked her questions for like an hour and a half. 
I was fa- I'd never met an atheistic, communistic, humanist who ran a camp to keep young people from becoming Christians. This was different. So I just asked questions for like an hour and a half and just listened and listened and listened. After about an hour and a half, she said to me, oh, I've been dominating the conversation. What, what do you do? <laughs> this is true. And I, her name was Ancha. And I said, Ancha, she was, she was uh, from East Germany. And I said, Ancha, almost exactly the opposite of you in everything you've just described. She said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm a, pa- I'm a Christian pastor. She says, you are not. <laughs> I said, yes, I am. She said, and that was our only, our only fight was, I'm like, no, I am. She said, no, you're not. Yes, I am. That was our only fight we had in our conversation. I had to convince her, I am a pastor. Um, and we, we, we had an amazing conversation. She actually said to me, then if you're a Christian pastor, why didn't you stop talking with me and tell me I was going to hell? That's what she said. And I said to her, Ancha, you're one of the most fascinating people I've ever met. So I've never met anybody quite like you. <laughs> and we ended up having about a half an hour, 45 minute Bible study because she was telling me, I, I, asked her, I asked her, what do you believe about Jesus? So she told me all these things she believed about Jesus. What do you believe about Christians? All horrible things. I mean, I told her, she told me how bad Christians were. I said, you know I said, Ancha, after I told her as a pastor, I said, Ancha, I've traveled all over the world and I've met tens of thousands of Christians and there's nobody who's that bad, horrible person you've described. I said, there's some people that are messed up that are Christians, but I said, I've never met that. I mean, you're describing all Christians as these horrible people. I said, I've never met any Christian like that. And I said, and then and she described Je- you know, her view of Jesus. And I said, I said, you know, and, and her, I just ended up saying to her, you know, have you ever read the story about Jesus from the Bible? She hadn't. I said, can I read to you some things from Jesus' story? And she said, sure. Got my Bible down. We had her Bible, studied the Bible together. See, you ask questions and you listen. And as she talked, I didn't agree. And by listening, I wasn't agreeing with her. I disagreed, but I heard her. And at the, end of the, at the end of the time, I actually said to her, I said, Ancha, I don't think you've probably gone this plane thinking you would leave here with a friend who's a Christian pastor. She said, no way. And she gave me her information and invited me, Sherry and I and the boys to come stay at her home if we were ever in East Germany. And I sent her a couple of books in the mail. And, you know, ask questions. Listen. And even when somebody, when somebody dis- says something you don't agree with, don't go, well, that's wrong, I disagree with you, you're evil, you know. Just listen. <laughs> and, and ask questions and understand where they're coming from and have conversations. And then one more action item, to say, I love to learn truth, and I know it can come from many surprising places. You know, there's a Latin phrase that that translated to English means, all truth is God's truth, because God owns the domain of truth. God is the truth. And so so there's there's truth that can be found in the athletic world. There's truth that can be found in media. There's truth that can be found in all kinds of worlds, and if there's truth there, God owns it, because God is the truth. And people may, I I was raised by a dad who was an atheist. But he taught me a lot of things that were true. And God was preparing me to be your pastor one day under a dad who didn't know God was doing that, but God was in that. So the, the realm of truth belongs to God. And so understand, I can talk to someone and listen to somebody who I disagree with, who's wrong in many ways, but there may be something that God teaches me through that person. I need to be open to that. And by listening to them doesn't mean I'm compromising or I agree with them. I grew up in a home where my dad, one of my dad's favorite lines, and my dad would always say it with kind of a smile on his face, but he'd say, hey, hey, I couldn't disagree with you more. Not a good one. I couldn't disagree with you more. But if you say it with a smile, and I've said that to people, I say, oh, man, I couldn't disagree with you more. <laughs> it doesn't mean I don't like you. It doesn't mean I'm going to end the conversation. We just totally disagree. And that's okay. Let's just not be nasty to each other. And as Christians, we need to be the ones who can say, I disagree with you. We don't land in the same place, but I still love you. Because that's what Jesus did with us. And that's what Jesus wants us to do with others. So how can I listen to you and learn from you even when we disagree? Those are some ways you can do that. Second simple lesson for today is this. I can love you and be loved by you even when we don't see things the same way. I can love you and be loved by you even when we don't see things the same way. You can have close friends. You can have people in your life that you walk with over time who you disagree with, and you can still love each other. I had the privilege of doing my dad and my mom's 50th renewal of vows. They were married 50 years. My mom passed away about nine years ago, but, but my, I was able to do their 50th renewal of vows. My dad and mom met when they were about 14 years old. Neither of them ever had another romantic interest in their life. They loved each other for all those years. And, and my dad was a hardcore vocal Republican. And my mom was a hardcore vocal Democrat. She led the, 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 the teachers' association for the Fountain Valley School District, and she and and they and they would have vibrant conversations, um, but but they loved each other, 
And, and as true as I'm standing here, my parents, I think they did this to model something to us, because they would, they would go off to vote holding hands, and they would say, hey, we're heading out to cancel each other's votes. <laughs> and they meant it. And they were teaching us that being in the process is important, but they knew that the net gain for either side was zero, because they were going to both vote straight party opposite sides. Um, and, and yet my, my parents loved each other. It's, and, and, and they weren't even followers of Jesus. If people who are followers of Jesus, who know the grace of Jesus, can't get along with someone who's different than them, we have a, we, we have a problem. And I think we have a chance, we have an opportunity in history right now, in our culture here, to show the high ground of loving people we disagree with. And if Christians don't own that high ground, I don't know if anybody's going to. I don't know if anybody's going to. So I, I invite you just to open your heart to a few more thoughts as we look at Matthew chapter 5. And your Bibles, turn to Matthew 5 or in your, on your phone or your iPad, just punch in Matthew chapter 5 and open that up. And uh, I want to look at Matthew chapter uh, 5, beginning in verse 43. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount, the best sermon ever preached in the history of the world. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is preaching to this crowd. And he says this, beginning in verse 43, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And back in those days, persecution was a serious deal. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. How can loving enemies and praying for those who persecute you make you more a child of God because you look like your daddy? When you do that, because that's what God did with you and did with me. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. What that, that word perfect means be fully mature. Be, grow into maturity, perfect maturity before God by the way that you love people who disagree with you, who don't like you, and who even say, you're my enemy. And we respond by loving and praying. And, and the, when it says pray for people, it doesn't mean, Lord, get them prayers. It means, Lord, change them. Lord, love them. Lord, saturate their life with your presence and draw them to yourself. It's praying meaningfully, not just, not just not, it's not, not retaliation prayer. It's, it's prayers of grace for God's power to work. So some observations from Jesus' teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. First, it's easy to hate those that we see as an enemy. It, it is natural and easy. This person's my enemy. They're against me, so I'm against them. And hate can grow in our hearts, and that's true for all of us. I don't care how tender, kind-hearted you are. Sometimes that hatred comes out, out verbally. Sometimes it comes out physically. Sometimes it just comes out emotionally that we just kind of stew and don't like. So we may never say anything, but man, we talk bad about them or we think bad about them. But that's easy to do. A second observation. Jesus takes and flips our perceptions and patterns upside down. Jesus does it so many times. You see the world like this, and Jesus says, if you're going to walk with me, get ready. Boom, I'm turning things over. You think you can hate your enemies. I'm telling you, love your enemies. And when people persecute you, get on your knees and pray for them. And that's countercultural. That's radical. That will shake your world to the foundation. And it should, because we're becoming like the one who came to us when we hated him and died for us. That's the one we follow. That's the one we say we love, and we say we're be that word Christian means little Christ. We're becoming like Jesus. So if you're a Christian or if you become a Christian, this is part of the journey, and it's tough, and it's challenging, and it stretches us. A third observation. We're called to be different. If you never, agree, if you never disagree with anybody in our culture, I don't think you're following Jesus close enough. Because when you follow Jesus, you're going to think different, you're going to act different, you're going to have a different code of morality, you're going to have a different way you treat people when they treat you well or when they treat you poorly. You're going to live differently. We're called to look different. Christians have been from the beginning, and that's okay. We can be different and we can disagree, we can still be kind and gracious and loving. Those things are not mutually exclusive. And our world's kind of saying, if you disagree with somebody, and somebody will say, oh, you disagree with me, then you hate me. It's like, no, I don't. I don't, not at all. I just believe that how you think of things or how you do things is wrong. But I don't hate you. And our world is sort of saying now, if you don't agree with somebody, then you, then you must hate them. And we have to be the ones to say, not true. And our lives have to bear that out. And then one more observation. We're expected to grow in maturity. 
God expects you and I to grow, to become more and more mature in how we interact with people and relate with people who aren't yet part of God's family. So living the lessons and finding peace among disagreements. Here's three just lessons or three takeaways for us to kind of ponder as we get ready to walk back into our lives in a world that's more and more divided. First uh, action item. I won't let disagreements, even level three, lead to hate in my heart. I won't let disagree, even when there's a profound, significant, serious disagreement. I'm gonna watch my heart and I'm gonna say, okay, I disagree with this person and they disagree with me. And, that, that's, and it's okay to disagree. But am I growing hateful towards them? Are my words becoming bitter and mean-spirited? Are my attitudes towards them hateful? And they say, I'm gonna fight that. I do not want to be that person because I belong to Jesus. And Jesus loved me when I hated him. And, and for me, in those moments, and, I, and I'm just telling you as, as, your, as, your, as one of your pastors here at Shoreline, when the people strongly disagree with me on things that really matter to me, I can feel that welling up. and I can feel some of that bitterness, some of that hatred start to, you know, and I think Satan wants to just throw fuel on that fire and make it grow. And here's the picture, I, here's what I try to put in my mind. I try to picture Jesus hanging on a cross with nails, between his, you know, nails through his wrists and nails through his feet. And he's looking down on these people who have crucified him, who are mocking him, who are making fun of him. And what does Jesus say? He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's my model. And I, I, don't, I don't nail that exactly all the time. I can feel the hatred and anger and bitterness start to grow in my heart. And I say, God, make me more like Jesus. Make me more like Jesus. And here's the thing. We're afraid that if we are kind to someone, it's sending the message, I agree with you. It's not. If somebody say, I have people say, well, what do you believe? And if people ask me specific questions, I give them specific answers. I'll, just, I'll say, no, I just, I'll just say, well, wow, we're on completely the opposite sides of that spectrum, aren't we? But it doesn't mean I don't love you. It doesn't mean our friendship has to end or our relationship has to end or we can't be family anymore. And that, I think, as Christians, we have to continue to strive for that. A second insight for our lives. I will begin praying for those I disagree with and even those who call me their enemy. Can you commit to start praying? You may say, I absolutely disagree with this person when I think about what they do, what they believe, how they function, how they live. I start to feel just, oh, all this stuff. And, say, and so, God, will you be, let me begin to pray. God. I pray, and maybe your prayer is, God, I pray you will change them and soften their heart. If they're living in a way that's anti to Christ and anti to what God wants, then say, God, change their heart. God, draw near to them. I pray there'll be a day where, where that person I could call brother or sister in Christ, and I maybe can't even imagine them ever getting there, but God, you have power to do it. Pray for them, but, but, but don't let bitterness grow within you. Will I pray? And then finally, I will extend acts of love to those who stand against me. I will actually do loving things and helpful things and kind things to people who say, I don't like you, I hate you, or I'm against you. If our culture, if our, if our world is going to be reclaimed from this polarized, angry chasm between people. You know, if, we, if we don't agree on something, then we have to all hate each other. If we're going to get beyond that, I believe it will have to be followers of Jesus who lead the way there. Because he, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin and took our sins and died for us in love while we didn't want anything to do with him. And so, and so we need to say, God, I will follow your way. God, I will hold your hand. God, I will live how you call me to live, even when it's hard, even when it challenges me, even when it stretches me. I can love you and be loved by you even when we don't see things the same way. And, and so our prayer needs to be that we would be those kind of people who look like Jesus and speak like Jesus and think like Jesus. And it's tough to do. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you will teach us and that you will speak to us. And Lord, where, where we have allowed bitterness and anger and hatred and dissension to grow in our hearts, Lord, soften those things and Lord, let those things subside within us. And Lord, let us, let us know that we can, we can disagree with someone and, and, and by loving them, it doesn't mean we're affirming what they say or how they live, it doesn't mean we're agreeing, but we can love someone right where they're at and then walk towards you and become more and more like you, Jesus. So teach us and Lord, may peace Fill our lives and our relational world. 
And we even pray we may peace fill this nation and fill this planet as followers of Jesus show love and grace and kindness even when we dramatically disagree. Jesus, thank you that you loved us when we wanted nothing to do with you. And you called us your own and you wrapped your arms around us. We give you praise for that and pray we can walk in that same kind of grace. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.